Bill Burns, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Jenny. Nice to be here. Yes, and thanks for coming on again. And how has your post-pandemic been unfolding? Are you getting out? Oh, yeah, it was great. I, I was actually down at the Fleischmann's Park uh, yesterday when they had uh, a baseball circus. There were probably 50, 60 little kids from age, uh, I'm saying five to uh, 10 with uh, a bunch of the parents, uh, fathers and mothers uh, coaching the youngsters and um, a lot of parents lined up around the field. It was really nice. It was nice to have the community uh, out doing something uh, with the kids. It was nice to see all the kids playing. So that was a lot of fun, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, so have you been socializing more? Uh, you know, I'm not a great socializing guy, but uh, I've, <laughs> you know, I've been out and we, we actually have a, a few uh, social events on the calendar for uh, June and July, which is certainly different than uh, during the pandemic. We, um, my wife and I, Gala, we never, during the pandemic, we didn't have any, uh, you know, gatherings with other couples or other people or that kind of thing. And so it's nice to be uh, having uh, some invitations to be with people uh, in June and July, kind of excited to be back to regular life. Yeah, it is exciting. It's exciting to see what people have been up to this past year because we've all been, well, I'm speaking for myself when I say I've been a bit insular. Yeah, I took a class with Riders in the Mountains. Great. Uh, during the sort of the tail end of uh, the pandemic, I took a, a poetry writing class with Lynn Domina, who is um, a wonderful teacher because she really allows it, uh, her uh, adult students to uh, to uh, have the freedom to express and to create, and she's very encouraging. Um, and uh, she's also a great poet herself. She uh, She's written a number and published a number of poems. I have a couple here. Uh, Framed in Silence and Corporal Work by Lynn Domina. And she's, um, she has a real spiritual edge to, uh, to her reverse, to her poetry. She used to be the, an English teacher at Delhi College. She's now the chairman of the English department at Northern Michigan University. And through the magic of Zoom, she's still able to uh, teach classes and writers in the mountains because you don't have to be local anymore, which is, I think the pandemic um, has uh, Writers in the Mountains uh, is a group that started here locally. I, I can tell you a little bit about the beginnings of that because I think it's an important part of our community. Yeah. And uh, what the pandemic has done is it's allowed uh, Writers in the Mountains to expand so that now a number of the uh, people who are teaching courses are not necessarily local. Um, and so you got some very accomplished people um, uh, with a lot of, on their resume teaching courses now. And um, I also, in this class, there was a, one of the students was from Connecticut. It was me and nine women. <laughs> it's a poetry <laughs> class. What do you expect? Um, uh, so uh, one of the uh, women was from Connecticut. One was out, I think, in Michigan. You know, one was traveling in a, uh, in a Winnebago uh, uh, on the road using her cell phone to connect. So that's kind of cool. But I would like to tell you a little bit about that organization, Writers in yes. the Mountains. Yes, yes, tell it us. It really started about, I'm saying 30 years ago, when a gal named Shelley Barry, a writer, uh, I'm not sure if, if she came up here to the mountains to make a, a presentation somewhere else, or whether she came specifically to make a presentation to the faculty at Margaretville Central School where I taught. But I remember Shelley uh, making a presentation at the school to our faculty. I was a member of that faculty. And uh, she was the author of a book called Chive. I have it right here, a children's book uh, aimed at kids 10, 11, 12, something like that, 13. Um, and uh, sh the, the beginnings of the Writers in the Mountains, to my understanding, started with Shelley Barry coming in and, and uh, um, kind of convincing people that, you know, just as there are uh, visual artists, you know, people who paint, who aren't necessarily um, um, painters by profession, there are lots of writers like myself 
who aren't writers by profession, we're not making a living out of it, but uh, who, uh, who enjoy doing that. And, and a number of local people kind of, excuse me? You're a natural historian of the area, Bill. I, uh, I know, and I like writing about history, but that's really the key is that uh, the local area, you know, uh, there's so much here in the Catskills. There's so much to think about, to know about, to write about. And that's one of the things I love. Yeah. But, but Sally I... Fairburn is a name that uh, um, is uh, an important name in the history of this group, writers in the, in the Catskill, in the mountains. So she was very instrumental. There may be others whose names I'm leaving out, and I apologize. But Sally was instrumental in getting this thing started. It really started as you know, kind of a group of rank amateurs, people who just want to write because they want to write, and now it's expanded into something uh, a little bit bigger than that. It's, it's, it's one of the neat institutions in our community, I think. Yeah, I'm doing their Modern Love class in July. Starting oh, in and, and in that one, you get an opportunity to write a little piece that uh, perhaps will end up in the New York Times. Yeah. Reported me by Jenny Neal in the New York Times. Yes. Yeah, I'm not going to get my hopes up. I, but, you know, the writing classes, I've taken one of your writing classes, and they really sort of help you. Um, they help you keep your writing on track and make it a habit, because exactly. writing really has to be a habit. I mean, exactly. the curiosity comes really easily, but uh, the, the writing, you have to really, you have to get into a routine of writing every day, even if it's a couple of paragraphs. Yes about what happened yes and that, and, the, and that really helps the beautiful thing about these courses is it does put you in a position where you have a piece of writing due each week yes so i took uh actually i think i took two from lynn domina during the course of the pandemic the first one was <coughs> excuse me writing about the movies uh-huh poems about movies yeah <coughs> or at least inspired by movies and the second one was poems about animals, or at least inspired by animals. Okay. And what that did, it forced me to uh, to produce a poem every week. Uh, after the, the movies one ended, I thought, well, I can keep this going. And of course I, I did, uh, because yeah. that outside uh, impetus to um, have something to show other people uh, really helps you to get right. Yeah, you really need that deadline. Mm -hmm. You really need the deadline. But I do write every day. Do you write every day, Bill? I don't write every day. I've never, I've, I've attempted it at times. I've never succeeded. Um, my writing tends to be much more um, sporadic than, than that and much more based on a particular project. Um, I've been working on a project uh, myself, uh, a long poem um, or a series of poems really that, um, you know, I, I've, I've been doing sort of in fits and starts. Um, and then um, I did just have a, uh, an article published in the uh, uh, Tri-County Historical Views. I wonder if you're familiar with this little publication. Yes, I love that. Where can we find that? I do too. And, and the new one just came out and it contains an article I wrote about the anti-rent war, which mm -hmm. is one of the great, uh, one of the great uh, historical moments of interest here in the Catskills back in the 1840s. Um, and now I just uh, met with the, the editor, uh, one of the editors, Carolyn Bennett, who is the uh, 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 director of the Pratt Museum up in Prattsville. And she is a co-editor of this magazine. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we agreed that I'm going to do an article on one of my favorite things in our local history and one that I lived through, and that's the Lexington Conservatory Theater. Back in 19, last half of the 1970s, 1976, 77, 78, 79, and 80, for five years, the best theater in America was being done right here in the Catskills. In really? the little town of Lexington, New York, I kid you not. Um, there was a, uh, a young genius, a guy by the name of Oakley Hall III, who comes, came from a um, uh, very literary family. His father, Oakley Hall II, wrote uh, a 
very well known, um, I shouldn't say very well known because I hadn't heard of it, so I take that back, but a well respected Western novel called Warlock, which is still considered a um, kind of a breakthrough Western novel because it was able to, 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 to tell a story that was set in the West, but have some uh, implications in that story for the current political climate. It was during McCarthyism, during the time when people were being persecuted for their political beliefs. Um, he also wrote Downhill Racer, which later became a pretty well-known Robert Redford movie about a downhill racer, a skier, uh, Robert Redford playing the lead. Well, his son, uh, Oakley Hall, uh, Hall III, was the artistic director and the, and the resident genius behind this group of about 30 young 20-something um, baby boomers uh, in the 1970s who came up to the Catskills, rented uh, from the Weisberg family a, uh, uh, an old theater camp uh, with a lot of old ramshackle buildings. Uh, if you've ever been up through Lexington, which yeah. is 11, 12 miles north of Shandaken, uh, you've seen the Lexington uh, Hotel that still stands here. You've seen the Lexington just, House, the big old- Just about. Yes. And everybody stayed in this big house and they put on six plays a summer and the stuff was fantastic. Uh, they put on a Frankenstein that was um, on opening night. The Frankenstein was uh, in this old what they called the River Theater. I'm, I'm blowing my thunder for the article uh, that um, was open to the Schoharie Creek. Outside, there was a thunderstorm going on. So when Dr. <laughs> Frankenstein put life into his creature, uh, thunder blew. And I was not at that opening. But my understanding is that people went out of the place screaming. It was, uh, <laughs> I did see the show in a different uh, venue. The great play they did was one about the death of Meriwether Lewis, of Lewis and Clark. He died mysteriously. Nobody was quite sure, was he murdered? Was it a suicide? What happened to Meriwether Lewis? Uh, he also had the reputation of having gone a little crazy after the uh, trip out with Lewis in the Lewis and Clark expedition of 1803, 1804. He wrote a play called Grinder's Stand, which um, Oakley Hall III did, uh, which, um, uh, was written in the same iambic pentameter that William Shakespeare wrote it, except it was an American English. And it just fabulous. And uh, that was the play that kind of made the cultural critics discover the Lexington Conservatory Theater and kind of put it on the map. Tragically, Oakley Hall III met a tragic accident. He lived through it, but it, it kind of changed the whole uh, composition of things. And the theater kind of petered out in 1980, moved to Albany, where it's still operating as Capitol Rep uh, in Albany. Uh, Gail and I had tickets to that for a while. Capitol Rep is a little more though, you know, kind of summer stocky, kind of like, even though it's not in the summer, but kind of like show given plays that a little more tame. There was nothing tame about the Lexington Conservatory Theater. I'll save the story of the accident for the article because it's really fascinating. Uh, but I'm really excited about this uh, this project. I am too because I've never heard of that. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I'll I'll put up on the website where we can get the Tri County Review and uh, and if you can send me a picture of it, I'll put that up just so that readers listeners can follow up. There, there, are, there are 18, uh, uh, I was just told there are 18 uh, retail outlets for the magazine. I don't know what they are, but I could put you in touch with Carolyn and she could let you know uh, where people, you could list where people could buy that magazine. Okay, great. And so let's go back to Writers in the Mountains because you were about, you, you, I interrupted you when you were talking about the founding members Shelly Barry and then Sally well, Fairbairn. Shelley, Shelley was not from here. She was the visiting writer who, as I recall, uh, kind of uh, inspired the idea. 
and then it was local people and and i'm sorry but sally's sally fairburn is the is the name i keep coming up with i can't name other people who were involved uh who uh, put that thing together but since that time I know Simona David, for example, who uh, lives over in uh, Roxbury. Uh, she was instrumental in kind of um, uh, regularizing the thing, institutionalizing it, kind of giving it a governing structure and, and a sense, you know, a permanence. Uh, because it really started, I think, as a bunch of people who gathered in the library. I was not among them. A bunch of people who gathered in the library to write together. And as now, uh, morphed into this um, a pretty extensive uh, program, all locally run here in the Catskills, centered really, I'm gonna say in Roxbury, Roxbury Arts Group, uh, certainly a, uh, a key to, uh, to the starting of that organization. And, and yet now, uh, A, with so many uh, people fleeing Brooklyn and Manhattan, to uh, come up here to the Catskills, and we hope they love it. Uh, with so many people here who ha have these kinds of interests, uh, it's it's been able to uh, expand, expand the teaching uh, crew, and as I've said, allowed for some people with some pretty, you know, pretty impressive resumes in terms of what they've been able to accomplish as writers in the metropolitan, uh, more metropolitan regions of America than we live in. Um, yeah so uh, I think I think we have a lot of uh writer historians here and I think it's important to encourage that um maybe I'll have Sally Fairburn on this YouTube channel to Sally would be a great one to get to talk about the history and the development of this thing as well as I mean she's involved in a lot I just saw her on the uh video uh, screen talking about the Watershed Agricultural uh, Council. So Sally, somebody who's been involved in a lot of things. I know she was also involved in the, uh, this is becoming the Sally Fairburn show. She was also involved in uh, the uh, opening up of the uh, Water Discovery Center, which I, I, I did go, we had a big baseball game here in flight. I talked about the little kids playing baseball, but yeah. on uh, Saturday of Memorial Day weekend, our Mountain Athletic Club here in Fleischmann's, which is the modern version of the baseball team that played in Fleischmann's in the 1890s and early, very early 20th century, uh, a baseball team that included such Hall of Fame luminaries as Honus Wagner, one of the first five well, baseball players installed in the Hall of Fame, and Miller Huggins, who was Babe Ruth's manager for the New York Yankees, uh, both played in Fleischmann's. So this modern version of vintage baseball uh, team uh, played a game on Saturday and unveiled an historical marker that pointed out that the field in Fleischmann's, the Mountain Athletic Grounds, the, what we call Fleischmann's Park, is now registered with the National Registry of Historic Places. Right. Uh, yeah. That's great. So this is, you mentioned last time, this is your 50th year of being a Catskill Mountain guy. Yes, it's my celebration year of being a Catskill. Yeah. How are you going to mark the occasion? Well, I'm going to write an article about uh, the Lexington Conservatory. <laughs> okay. One of the things I'm going to do. Uh, you know, it's just, I came here uh, with a lot of uh, young people, we were young at the time, came here just as so many people are coming here now. Um, it was 1971, I came to teach at Margaretville Central School, but I could, I did have another job offer in, um, um, in, in where I went to college in Schenectady. And um, I wanted to, to come to the Catskills. Um, I uh, had a friend here who introduced me to the place. It's, it was like nothing that I knew um very different from suburban post-war Westchester County I grew up in the high suburbs of uh, of uh, New York City in in the post-war years and uh, found that place empty more cows than people I, I found it empty of meaning 
I found it was just, it was a place where people slept and then they went to work in New York City. It was a place that I don't know. I just I, I consider myself a refugee from the suburbs. That's that's how where I've always been. And I came here and I found a place where. Yes, there was beautiful nature, but there was also it's amazing group of people who are very different from the people I knew growing up in the high suburbs of metropolitan New York. Uh, people who seemed to be much more authentic, people who were connected to the places where they lived, people who were able to grow old in their own houses, the very same house in which they had raised their children, if they had children, people who, um, who um, simply seemed to me to be something much more real, and uh, again, I'm going to use the word authentic, than anything I had known in uh, in where I grew up, you know, I mean, if, if you most lots of people have read um, have read uh, the uh, Catcher in the Rye, and and you know, I think one of the themes of that book was the vapidity, if I can use that kind of vap the kind of emptiness, the kind of vapidness, the kind of uh, that uh, uh, post war uh, society seemed to develop, and I felt that. Um, rightly or wrongly, hmm. and here I felt something different. And uh, so, being here now, fifty years, uh, is sort of a way for me to to mark the fact that uh, been here fifty years. I don't, yeah. I don't know if it means anything other than uh, I'm happy to be a Catskill Mountain guy. Yeah. So, do you think a lot of people here are introverted? And uh... well. Perhaps. I, I think that um, a small town life like we have here gives us, I think, two things. It does give us it, the, uh, although, you know, the kids in school always complain that everybody knows your business in a small town. So there's some of that as well. Yeah. But I think that um, we do have an opportunity to get away from others, but we also have a, a sense of community. I mean, I don't know if you got a chance to stop at the, um, chicken barbecue that was held. Uh, Lori Fairburn really organized that chicken barbecue to my knowledge. Um, my kids grew up with Lori. I've known Lori since she was a little girl and always loved her. Um, and um, uh, it was just incredible. There were literally a hundred people crowded into around this big table of food and this huge racks of chicken. And it was all for Bill and Dee Fiedler. Yeah. Who, as so many people know, went out to dinner, the pandemic being done, and came home to find their lives shattered by uh, a devastating fire. And um, the way the community, you know, turned out for our own, I'm not sure that happens every place. The other thing I think, I read once that a cultural critic, not sure who it was, who said that to live in the modern city is to live among architecture. Yeah. I got thinking, you know, you and I, Jenny, live among nature. Yeah. We live in a forest. We don't live among architecture. Architecture is very much just a, a sidelight. It's uh, it's a house here and a house there and a and a and a hamlet that if you blink your eye, you're through it. You didn't know you went through it. And what yeah. really matters is not architecture, but trees and uh, mountains and hills and vales and hollows. And um, to me, that's, um, that is a very special gift, I think, that those of us who have chosen to make our lives in the mountains have, have gotten for ourselves. Now, we've lost some things as well. I remember doing a... Um, a fundraiser for the John Burroughs Woodchuck Lodge, and a friend of mine was very willing to use his uh, hall that he had to uh, put it on. And he said to me, and he's a guy who, you know, has been living up here, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 years now, but this was earlier in his, uh, maybe more. And he said to me, we're going to have a charcuterie. <laughs> and I, I guess I was a little embarrassed to say to him, what's that? Because living in the mountains, it's cold cuts. Uh, I didn't know what a charcuterie was. 
I don't know what cold cuts were. (laughs) Uh, Another person was mentioned that they were having a uh, pop-up store. I thought, wow, what a cool idea. I had no idea that people have been doing pop-up stores for years. Uh, (laughs) When uh, Peg Ellsworth told me that her husband was going to have a food truck, I said, wow, that's a cool idea. I had no idea that food trucks were big (laughs) because all of these things are urban, um, accoutrements of urban living. Yeah. This is how much I know about urban living. (laughs) I don't know anything. I've lived in the mountains for 50 years. And sometimes I know I've, maybe I've lived in the mountains too long in terms of <laughs> knowing what's going on in the larger society. But is it really important to know what a charcuterie is? No. I don't think so. Yeah. No. It's just another word, you know. It's just another word. I, I didn't know what cold yeah. cuts were. I, I, I left, um, I taught at Marketable Central School until 1980. 1980, I, I, I went to Antiora. I crossed the... Um, high mount. And when I got to Antiora, I always had kids give speeches in the class. And one of them was how to make something. And this kid made sushi, made California rolls for the class. It was the first time I'd ever had sushi. Delaware County, you didn't have sushi, um, at least in those days. Yeah, and we I don't know momos. Huh? We do have momos though, Catskill momos in Delhi. There you go. No, well, yes. Yeah, right now. Yeah. Little dumplings. Yeah. And uh, what do you think of all the people moving up here? There's so many people moving up here now. Um, you know, it, it's exciting. You know, I, I hope that, um, that folks who come up here come up here looking for something, not just running away from something. Um, I hope that, um, that the, you know, feeling a little bit more um, free and a little bit less threatened by the pandemic and the virus um, is, is just is one element that, and the other element is, wow, isn't this a great place to be? I want to be part of this. I hope that those folks are going to, you know, decide that nature, privacy, and community all go together and that uh, that'll be part of it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I welcome them. And my understanding is that Delaware County is, or excuse me, town of Middletown, where where we live, Jenny, uh, which includes Margaretville and Fleischmann's and New Kingston and uh, Kelly Corners and so on and so forth. Traditionally, it's been a, a fourth biggest town in um, in uh, Delaware County, and uh, political power is based on population at the Board of Supervisors. My understanding is when the results of the census come out, we may be the biggest town in Delaware County because of this population expansion. And then the other thing is the the um, uh, you can get a cup of espresso in Margaretville now. It's like <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. So, uh, uh, John and uh, Dean, I think their names are, opened up the little cafe on Main Street, the uh, uh, French pastry shop and uh, and uh, coffee shop where you can get a. Uh, uh, chai latte and a cappuccino and so on and so forth and and of course those of us who've who've lived here a long time i think are are thrilled to be able to get a cup of espresso (laughs) so um did you get to hyde park because you were going to go to hyde park and become a researcher there yes that was the idea was that um, i had once i was going to write an article about the Roosevelt's, Franklin and Eleanor, and their connection to the Catskills. I think I might have mentioned it the last time that, yes. you know, that, that, that we have a couple of presidents of the United States who are close to us. Well, Franklin Roosevelt closest, Martin Van Buren, uh, people who, uh, who served in the highest, who, who led our country, and their neighbors in a sense. So I, I wanted to know what was the connection, how, how much did Roosevelt get across the river into our part of, uh, of upstate New York? I went down there, I got my researcher card, felt terrific. I got a researcher card <laughs> in the library, planned to go back, and then the virus hit, which meant that the library closed. Library is still closed. Oh. So without, without being able to go to the library and actually do that hands-on research, which was really going to be the most fun of the writing the article, yeah. it didn't make any sense. So actually, when I, I was going to Prattsville, as I mentioned last week, to meet with the uh, editor, and I knew that 
they were still looking for this Franklin Roosevelt article, I knew it wasn't really something that had me excited because if I can't go to the library, that was really what I wanted to be able to do. And I drove through Lexington to get there and went, whoa, Lexington Conservatory Theater. And when I pitched that idea, they liked it. Mm. And I actually had my first interview yesterday. I went up to, um, this is great for people who enjoy theater. And I'm sure a number of your Upstate Dispatch uh, subscribers do. We have a great little uh, theater up in Catskill. It's called the Bridge Street Theater. And it's run by a, a couple of two men who, um, um, one of them, Stephen Patterson, was a veteran of the Livingston Conservatory Theater. That's one of the things that drew them upstate to start the Bridge Street Theater in Catskill, New York. So I got a chance to go over yesterday and have an in-person interview with him. We did wear masks, although we're both fully vaccinated, but Stephen felt that with the number of people they see in the theater business, it's probably best. And uh, we had a great conversation about that um, wonderful, wonderful experience that he had 45 years ago in the 1970s um, at that theater. And it sort of got my research going. So I got the assignment on uh, Friday and I got my first interview on Tuesday. So like, I'm a little go-getter here. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, well, you have to come back and tell us how that's going. I will. So um, is, I really wanted to ask you how many, how have you able to, how have you been able to continue reading during the pandemic? Because my reading kind of suffered. I, you know, I, I just felt I, like I was reading reading all the time. Good point. I wonder why reading suffered. Or you one would think that during the pandemic that would be the time to read War and Peace. You know. Yeah. But I think that um, for me, submersing myself in a book requires a little bit of peace of mind that maybe, or if not peace of mind, maybe a little bit of depression, you know, where you want to, that yeah. maybe, you know, the pandemic sort of kept us all on edge, on edge a little bit, you know, and yeah. um, um, so, but I, I have attended, there are, uh, there are lots of people who when they start a book, they have to finish it. Yeah. I'm not one of them. <laughs> um, so I can start a book and quit it midway through if it's just not doing it for me anymore. Yeah. Uh, I did a lot of that. I can also <laughs> read two books at the same time, you know, sort of taking what I want out of each one. I've done some of that. Um, I also, I have a Kindle. So it's very easy when you're watching um, uh, you know, uh, the morning news and they have a story just the other day I was watching and they had a story about uh, a new book about George H.W. Bush, uh, his post presidency. And uh, I always admired him. And particularly I admired his um, post presidency, you know, jumping out of airplanes at age 80 and 90 and that kind of stuff. And, and just the whole family, there was a certain family dynamic and Yale and I, for a number of years, went up to Maine in the summertime, and I'd always want to make it a point to drive by Walker Point, which is a nine-acre peninsula into the Atlantic owned by, well, at that time, George H.W. Bush. I'm sure his sons and daughters own it now. Um, so I bought the book. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's um, um, you know, Amazon Kindle, so, you know, you see a book that looks interesting, boom. Then I, you know, I'm doing the research on, uh, on um, the uh, Catskill or the Lexington Theater and, and Oakley Hall III, and I read about his father, Oakley Hall II, in this book, Warlock, which I had not known about, as I mentioned. So, boom, I buy the book, War Warlock. Doesn't mean I'm going to read them, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, have so many books that I have not read. <laughs> I, got, I got the New York Public Library app. Uh-huh. Because remember when I went to register at the New York Public Library to do some uh, research and, and read John Burroughs's personal papers? Yes. Remember that? I had to join the library. Yes. So because I joined the, you know, the big, the main New York Public Library, I was able to go online and download their app with my library card. And now I, because I do the same thing as you do, I start books and if it's not, 
it doesn't grab me, then I'll just stop reading it. Right. And so that now I don't buy books. I I down I download them through the app, and if they're really interesting, then I'll buy them. Yeah, I still have the uh, the uh, buying books of disease as yeah. well as the uh, as the Kindle thing. And actually, you mentioned Burroughs. Uh, one of the things that we, we, you and I have both been Burroughs people and are Burroughs people. Uh, John Burroughs, one of the things that made him so well known was that he was taught in the schools. And, um, but yet I never really had could put my hand on what exactly were they teaching in school. So there's this wonderful used book website called Abe's, A-B-E, Abe's oh, Book. Oh, yeah. You can go into Abe's books and uh, and find pretty much whatever you want because it's really a sort of, it seems like a clearinghouse for a lot of other. So when they send it, it might come from Texas. It might come from South Carolina. You don't know where the book's coming from. Um, so I found it, a woman whose name escapes me at the moment, but a teacher had taken Burroughs essays and put them into this little book called Birds and Bees. And that was the book that was brought into the schools. So kids, and usually it was what we would call today middle school. So it would be kids in those days would be in the upper end of the one room schoolhouse of the, of the eighth grade education. They'd be seventh, eighth graders would be reading um, essays by Burroughs, which may have been edited a little bit to get them to the right reading level. Um, in school in these little books. So I found a number of, of books related to Burroughs like that, that, that I was able to uh, buy. Also, uh, hmm. the Woodchuck Lodge, uh, which by the way, I'm gonna be giving tours at Woodchuck Lodge this Saturday, the first, and we have a program, and I think the program's on snakes, I'm not sure. Yes. It's on snakes, right? Yeah. So the yeah. tours, it, it should be pretty interesting. It's a chance to get outside, hopefully we'll have good weather, it's a chance to be among people, but with some distance if you're feeling a little uncomfortable because you're on a lawn, so you have a lot of room to spread out. And yeah. to learn something about nature, you know, I'm not real fond of snakes. I don't know a lot about snakes, but it'd be interesting to learn something about snakes. Yeah. And then that program's at one o'clock, and then from 11 until the program at one, and from two or so when the program's over until, I think, four, I'll be, you know, I'm available to give people tours of, of the lodge. It's really a nice way to spend an afternoon and to learn both about John Burroughs, who particularly for your upstate dispatch uh, subscribers who have moved recently to the Catskills, I like to say that John Burroughs is the presiding spirit of this part of the Catskills. Yeah. Yesterday, driving over to Catskill, I went through an area where I'm willing to say Rip Van Winkle, even though he's a fictional character, is the presiding spirit of that part of the Catskills. But out here in the west slope of the Catskills, it's John Burroughs, the great writer and naturalist. And it'd be a great opportunity for people to learn about him, as well as if they have children particularly, maybe the children get an opportunity to pet a snake. Okay, well, you know, I'm going to put this uh, interview up on the website, on the YouTube channel this afternoon, unedited, so that we might be able to get some more people coming to Woodchuck Lodge on Saturday. Yeah, Woodchuck Lodge is really a cool place. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, Bill, thanks for coming on. You're very Thank engaging. You. Do you have any public speaking things apart from the Saturday at Woodchuck Lodge? Because that's the next round. We are planning a uh, Carolyn Bennett at the at the, at the uh, Pratt Museum, um, and I are planning. We haven't set a date yet, but probably in August, a poetry reading at the Pratt Museum, in which I would read, Carolyn would read, and a wonderful young writer from Shandaken named Paula Dutcher, student of mine, uh, will be reading as well. So. Uh, uh, Right now, that's my next public speaking uh, thing that I'm aware of anyway. Great. Okay, so, me. I'm always available. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Maybe I will. Okay. Well, Bill, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Jenny. Appreciate it.